As the internet became widely available to the public, it has surely affected societal trends in significant ways. Two of the trends which were majorly changed forever were fashion and art. Previously, these areas would be dominated by one style at a time, and these styles would be dictated by those at the top. Fashion would be determined by politicians, and later movie stars and musicians. Art style would often be dictated by what the institutions would want people to paint at the time. The only way change in either of these social trends would occur is if a bold new group or person came out to the scene and became so popular that they and their style would become the new status quo. And then fashion and art would follow their lead until someone else became the new status quo. Obviously, there was always a counterculture and people adhering to their own style, but these groups were few and far between. The internet changed all of this. Now, there was a democratization of style. People no longer got all their cultural information from the famous few who ran the show. No, now anybody could share their opinion on art and fashion styles. And since these alternative styles were more easily accessible to view, what were once small fringe groups now grew into extremely large communities of people who adhere to a style. This, combined with the fact that social change over the past 50 years made it more acceptable for people to express themselves however they wanted to, led to a renaissance of new fashion and art styles. I mean, compare the variety in fashion styles in high schools 50 years ago to the fashion of today, there's definitely a lot more diversity now. However, it didn't just limit itself to fashion and art, it grew into something more. Aesthetics. Aesthetics is not a new term, but the way it is used now, especially on the internet, is new. At this point, an aesthetic is a label you put on something to determine its mood or vibe. While aesthetics certainly apply to fashion and art, recently the term has been used to describe images, architecture, text, and just life in general. It's very hard to explain, but I hope that as we go through this video, the visual definition will become clearer. Thanks to the vastness of the internet, many different aesthetics have been created. Some of these have grown to overwhelming popularity, while others have remained in obscurity. As someone who loves the corners of the internet and what it can create, aesthetics are right up my alley, and exploring cyberspaces to see how they are used is really fun. Today, we'll be taking a look at many different aesthetics and what define them. This video is an adaptation and an exploration of Reddit user Silent Chatter's iceberg. It will work like a usual iceberg video, where the most obscure aesthetics will be saved until the end. While the first couple layers are more fashion and culture trends, as we go deeper into the iceberg, the aesthetics become more and more rooted in the internet and the subcultures. So make sure to stick around, because there is some really cool stuff on here. So without further ado, let's explore the aesthetics iceberg. The Visco aesthetic is appropriately the first entry of the iceberg because it is one of the most popular aesthetics today, especially among high school and college students. Visco gets its name from the photography app Visco, which allows users to post a feed of images they can edit with built-in filters. Visco is most commonly used in reference to Visco girls, who are girls that adhere to the fashion trend defined by this aesthetic. They are almost the evolution of the Starbucks girl stereotype popular a couple years ago. The aesthetic is popular among upper middle class teenage girls, stereotypically white, but in reality they are of all races. They are often carrying Hydro Flasks, a pricey water bottle brand. Fashion associated with Visco girls are scrunchies, oversized t-shirts, jeans, yoga pants, short shorts, Vans shoes, as well as messy but not unkempt hair. The vibe associated with them is casual prep. They are definitely well off and focused on their future, but they will still take it easy. The fashion can change depending on the time of year, but this general theme stays. For some reason, they tend to be stereotyped and made fun of on the internet, but you can just chalk this up to angsty male teenagers mad that the popular girls don't pay attention with them. While some can be annoying, in my experience most are quite pleasant and friendly. Of course, we can't forget about the Visco boys. Although rarer than Visco girls, they still come from the same background and have the same interests and mindset as Visco girls. This naturally means that a lot of Visco boys and girls end up starting relationships. E-boys and e-girls can be seen as the flip side of the coin from Visco boys and girls. 
this aesthetic is almost as, if not just as popular as the Visco aesthetic, since the aesthetic exploded in popularity on TikTok over the past couple of years. However, e-boys and e-girls tend to be more pessimistic than their Visco counterparts. They also go for interests that are more counterculture, although still popular, as the media they consume, such as certain musical artists or anime, are still quite popular among the general population. The fashion aesthetic is inspired by the grunge of the past, although it is definitely softer. A popular outfit is a striped long t-shirt with a graphic tee on top, usually depicting some interest of theirs like a band or a show, and either ripped jeans on both genders or plaid skirts on girls. Both genders are also notable for their use of makeup, with both boys and girls rocking black nail polish, eyeliner, and even lipstick. The hair tends to be parted down the middle and usually dyed. Stans is a term that is the shortened version of stalker fan. It was originally coined as a negative term used to describe someone who was so obsessed with a celebrity that it became downright unhealthy. However, now, while Stan is still defined as an obsessive fan, the negative stigma around them has reduced, and many people proudly identify as Stans. While people can stand any celebrity, the two most common types of Stans tend to be K-pop Stans and Twitch streamer Stans. The Stan aesthetic is a good example of an aesthetic that gives off a vibe rather than something you can see through a visual medium. You can find this aesthetic in certain circles of Twitter, where people will use terminology like tea, snatched, locals, and mutuals as part of the culture. On Twitter, stands usually talk about how perfect their preferred celebrity is, both looks and personality-wise, and they will viciously attack any criticism of the person they stand. They also will often share edits and fanfiction of the people they stand, and all this combines to create a unique aesthetic of celebrity worship that we haven't really seen before. Vaporwave is a recent aesthetic to pop up, gaining popularity in the 2010s. But despite being such a new creation, it has gained immense popularity. Vaporwave is, first and foremost, a genre of music. This music is often sampled off of 80s synth combined with smooth or lounge jazz. This music is then slowed down and distorted to evoke a sense of twisted nostalgia. However, there is also a strong visual aspect to Vaporwave. A huge part of the aesthetic is consumerism, with much of the artwork featuring corporate logos and hardware from the 80s and 90s, such as the Windows 95's logo. Other aspects of the art style include hard lines in the form of grids and shapes, as well as neon 80s color schemes. Japanese text is also present, as well as some works using visuals from 80s and 90s anime. The whole aesthetic is supposed to evoke distorted nostalgia from what we thought was a better time, the decades of the 80s and 90s. It's so powerful that even someone like me, who was born in the 2000s, also gets feelings of nostalgia. If I had to assign a vibe to Vaporwave, it would have to be the feeling of a joyride on a summer night in a coastal city like Miami or LA, hence the reason why palm trees are often depicted in Vaporwave works. This is an example of an aesthetic that is only depicted in art or vibes, as there really isn't any Vaporwave fashion. Horror is an extremely well-known aesthetic based on the genre of the same name. Obviously, horror is a genre intended to frighten, shock, and disgust those who view it. While there are many different genres of horror which get reactions out of you in different ways, the genre typically has an antagonistic force trying to kill or otherwise hurt you. Thanks to this fact, horror aesthetic tends to revolve around these frightening images, as well as blood and black colors. In terms of fashion, horror has a lot of similarities to goth and emo, as those are also dark in intention, but we will cover those later. If there's anything horror has that those aesthetics don't, it's that a lot of people into the horror aesthetic will often incorporate fake blood into pictures of themselves. Softies are considered the third corner in the modern fashion trend trifecta, alongside Bisco and e-boys and e-girls. Soft boys and soft girls go for a cute, youthful look, almost childish. The look often includes them wearing pastel colors, but muted. Sometimes they can also be wearing more light, earthen tones if pastels aren't up their alley. Like the name suggests, softies wear, well, soft and comfortable clothes. Oversized hoodies and sweaters are a staple of this aesthetic, as well as jeans, plaid skirts, and long swept hair. Stuffed animals are also a cornerstone of the whole softie vibe.
Emo is basically the older, more raw version of the e-boy aesthetic. It arose in the 1980s as subculture of punk. At the time, punk was dominated by aggressive men, so emo arose as a way for people to show a more emotional side of the same type of music, hence the name emo. Despite being around for a while, emo gained popularity in the late 2000s because its edgy, melodramatic nature made it perfect for the angsty teens of the time. The fashion included longer hair swept to a side with side bangs, as well as piercings and all black clothing, basically how every teenager looked like in 2008. Goth is yet another subculture of punk. Goth arose in the late 1970s as part of the UK rock scene. The style revolves around mystery and death, with the fashion often trying to emulate the look of a ghost, with black and white clothing as well as chains being essential to the style. It is encouraged in the goth community that clothes should be secondhand or thrifted. Of course, black makeup and piercings can also be expected. While a lot of goths can have longer hair, short hair or even shaved heads across all genders is not uncommon. The goth community is often frustrated by the fact that they are often mistaken for other aesthetics like emo. But these misconceptions continue to this day. One of the best examples is how many young men now express a desire for a goth girlfriend, even though the aesthetic that they really want is e-girl, since they'll probably think goth is too extreme. This entry refers to the vibes around colors themselves. Basically, each color will have a mood or a meaning associated with it. Obviously, I can't cover all of them, but some examples are how black represents mystery and power, blue represents coolness and serenity, red represents passion, and yellow represents joy. The aesthetic of metal is loud, and I'm not just talking about the genre of music, even though it certainly is loud, with the fast tempos, extreme drumming, and screaming singers. Even the look is very loud and in your face. I mean, just look at the logos of metal bands. The fashion, despite being simple, is distinctive. Metalheads will often wear all black with a shirt of their favorite band, boots, and leather jackets. In terms of hair, you either have really long hair as well as full facial hair for guys, or no hair at all. There tends to be no in-between. Tattoos and piercings are also quite common. Once you get to the more extreme metalheads, the fashion becomes even more aggressive, with their jackets and boots often brandishing spikes. Despite their hostile look, metalheads are known to be one of the kindest groups within the music community. And here we have punk, which is the root of many of the aesthetics we have already talked about. In terms of looks, punk is similar to its children aesthetics except that it's a tad bit more colorful, with plaid being a popular fashion choice. However, punk is less of a fashion choice and more of an ideology. Punk is actually the flip side of the coin from hippie culture. Both are rooted in accepting all types of people and rejecting societal norms and intolerances. However, while hippie culture is laid back, punk culture is aggressive. They don't want change, they demand change. After all, punk arose in the United Kingdom in the 70s as a response to Margaret Thatcher's extremely conservative regime. As such, punk has become the de facto aesthetic of rebellion and disobedience, whether it be a teen rebelling against their parents or an entire generation rebelling against the status quo. Hippie was the counterculture fashion aesthetic of the 1960s. It revolved around peace, nature, music, and drugs. They were extremely popular in the United States in the mid-60s to the mid-70s, and are mostly well known for massive events like the musical festival of Woodstock and their opposition to the US involvement in the Vietnam War. The hippies preached a culture of peace, tolerance, and harmony with nature. They were quite frugal, often making their own clothes and growing their own vegetarian food. Because of this, the fashion style of the hippie was a mixture of earthen and colorful, the most recognizable design of the hippie aesthetic is the tie-dye pattern, which was made by soaking a white t-shirt in a tub of dye mixture. Other fashion choices of hippies, when they were even wearing clothes at least, were long jackets, wide bottom jeans, large sunglasses, ribbons, and homemade jewelry. While the hippie lifestyle as a whole died out in the late 1970s, the fashion is still very influential to this day, with the clothing style still being worn. 
Ironically, instead of just making it yourself or thrifting it, heavy clothes instead have to be bought at designer stores for $50 at the very minimum. Which, honestly, is really funny in my opinion because it goes against everything the hippies stood for. Anime slash cosplay is an aesthetic that revolves around Japanese animation, specifically those from the 90s to the early 2000s. The reason why cosplay is grouped in with anime is because a lot of the fashion aesthetic comes from people dressing up in the style of anime characters, which can technically be considered cosplay. In the West, anime has always had a decently active following for a long time, and some anime have been quite successful in the West, such as Pokemon. However, it has really exploded in popularity here during the 2010s, thanks to the immense success of shows like Attack on Titan and JoJo's Bizarre Adventure among Western audiences. Now, in the 2020s, most younger people are watching at least some anime or are at least aware of its presence in pop culture. The anime aesthetic is mostly a fashion style that girls will choose to dress up as. While it's rare to see someone dressed up in full anime getup, it is quite common to see people take the parts of the style and incorporate it into their outfit. Some distinguishing features of the cosplay style are anime graphic tees, brightly colored skirts, mismatched socks, hair clips, bows, blush, and sometimes even Japanese style school uniforms and book bags. Basic White Girl is the aesthetic that I said was a precursor to the Visco Girl. The term arose in the 2010s and it was used to describe the typical teenage girl in the high school. The term was used mostly by teenage boys to make fun of the girls at school that they deemed as shallow, but you have to admit that at least the aesthetic was common among high school girls. The common denominator were clothes that were recognizable, comfortable, and easily available. This included large sweaters, yoga pants, Uggs, as well as ear piercings. They'll often carry branded handbags from local retailers. These girls often purchase items that are considered the most popular brand of that specific item, such as Starbucks coffee and iPhones. Because of this, many people consider them shallow and uninteresting, only doing stuff because it's the popular thing to do. But in my opinion, this is kind of projection. Keep in mind, the people who make fun of basic white girls are mostly Redditors whose favorite YouTuber is the most popular YouTuber, whose favorite game is the most sold game of all time, and whose favorite platform is one of the largest social media platforms ever. Who's considered basic now? Overall, even if basic white girl fashion is lowest common denominator, I say that there's nothing wrong with liking these things if it makes you happy. A tomboy refers to a girl who prefers to present herself in a more masculine manner, as well as engage in hobbies that are typically considered for boys, especially physical activity. They can act more assertive or even aggressive to try and separate themselves from the stereotypically more submissive girls, but they are ultimately kind-hearted due to the tomboy aesthetic being about free spirit and embracing who you are. Fashion associated with tomboys is loose-fitting clothing like t-shirts, jeans, and flannel. Also, some sort of baseball hat is extremely common. Stereotypically, tomboys have short hair, however it is not necessary and there are a bunch of tomboys with longer hair. Tomboys also usually don't bother with makeup, but to be honest, I'm a guy who has no knowledge of makeup whatsoever, so my idea of a natural, no makeup look probably still uses makeup in some way. Tomboys have actually been around for quite a long time, way longer than I've been alive, so now girls who choose to embrace the tomboy lifestyle are pretty accepted and not seen as abnormal. The skater aesthetic is an aesthetic revolving around well, skating. Basically, skater boys and girls are those who skateboard or longboard as their primary hobby. The aesthetic includes flat bottom shoes, mostly vans, as well as graphic tees, hoodies, shorts, and jeans. Skaters can usually be found in abandoned and dirty places that are good for skating, but of course the griminess of it is part of the aesthetic. Many people who are not skaters wear outfits that are part of the skater aesthetic, myself included. Normally, skaters don't have a problem with this since skater clothes and shoes are just comfortable and convenient to wear for day-to-day -day life. The issue arises if you're a poser and you pretend to skate when you don't. Stoner is an aesthetic revolving around people who smoke the devil's lettuce, aka weed. And before we get into this part, keep in mind that I am not promoting the use of this drug, just explaining what the aesthetic is about. 
This goes for any other entries on this iceberg where this disclaimer is relevant. Anyways, the stoner aesthetic is all about the lifestyle of people who use weed. Typically, this means a lot of the visuals are about smoking the plant and the various items used to do so. Also, the hobbies stereotypically associated with stoners are part of the aesthetic, such as painting, drawing, reading, meditating, and gardening. In terms of fashion, stoners tend to wear whatever is the most comfortable, which fits their laid-back nature. Items of clothing include joggers, hoodies, and beanies. Other visuals include, of course, the marijuana leaf, red eyes, and smoke. If you want to find a real-world example of this aesthetic, just head over to your local high school and you'll be sure to find tons. The athlete aesthetic revolves around sportswear and exercise of any kind. For that reason, this aesthetic is quite broad in scope, but there are some common aspects that tie this aesthetic together. Most fashion of the athlete aesthetic includes wear that is convenient for exercise, like tracksuits, running shorts, solid colored t-shirts and tank tops, and yoga pants. Of course, clothes and equipment worn for specific sports will also fall under athlete fashion. Also, while not technically falling under exercise clothing, merchandising for sports teams, such as a team hat or a jersey of your favorite player, also falls under athlete aesthetic. Visuals of this aesthetic include exercise locations or equipment, such as weights or other things you can find in the gym, or tracks and other sports fields. Typically, the athlete aesthetic tends to be positive and revolves around self-improvement and motivation, telling you to push yourself to the limit to become the best version of yourself. So this is two videos in a row, I'm talking about furries. I guess this can be considered an aesthetic, but it's not really a fashion style you'd see in day-to-day -day life, so I guess it's more of an artistic style. Furries are a large fandom who are into anthropomorphized animals, most often mammals like wolves. The animals would often have a human torso and legs, but retain their animal paws, tail, and head. The art is usually stylized in an anime-like fashion with large cartoon eyes. The colors used are also usually bright and neon. A significant subset of furries actually make suits in the style of the art in real life, called fursuits. These fursuits are actually quite expensive to make, costing several thousand dollars. Those who own one will often wear them and go to furry conventions where they can hang out with other furries. Fantasy is an aesthetic mainly devoted to the fantasy genre of books and movies. These often take place in a medieval European inspired setting. Although fictional elements like magic, strange creatures, and different intelligent races, as well as a more clean and beautiful world than the actual medieval ages are part of the aesthetic. This is more of an artistic aesthetic because nobody really walks around dressed like fantasy characters except for cosplay at a convention. But we should totally normalize dressing up like fantasy characters because they look so cool and why should we deprive ourselves of looking like that? Now moving to almost the opposite of fantasy, cyberpunk is a genre which can basically be described as high-tech, low-life. Cyberpunk stories take place in the near future, often within the next 100 years, and the genre usually explores a dystopian future and warns of the consequences of letting capitalism run rampant. Typically, cyberpunk will take place in a city, where bright neon lights and cool technology contrast with poor living conditions for most as well as an oppressive state. Cyberpunk genre became really popular in the 1980s with films like Blade Runner and Akira. Cyberpunk actually has a fashion associated with it, called techwear. Techwear consists of usually all black clothing, with oversized hoodies and either shorts or pants with lots of straps on them. Honestly, I think that this style is kind of boring, because looking at cyberpunk movies we can see that there's a lot of cooler stuff you can wear, with more bright neon colors. Cyberpunk is a really popular aesthetic, just because it captures our imagination of the future and how it will look like. I mean, even if it is a dystopian concept, I'm sure many of us have fantasized about walking the streets of Blade Runner's Los Angeles, or Akira's Neo Tokyo. The funny thing is that both of these movies take place in the late 2010s and early 2020s, and while we don't have the cool tech or megacities the 80s predicted, we do have the oppressive states and rampant capitalism, so I guess we're halfway there. Minimalism as an aesthetic refers to a style that lacks clutter and busyness. 
and instead opting for simplicity. Minimalism is often used to refer to interior designs of buildings with monocolor furniture that has no design or styling on them. Minimalist art also follows the same philosophy, often just being a sketch on a white piece of paper. There's also another art style referred to as minimalism, which doesn't follow the monochrome aesthetic but instead opts to paint a scene without detail, such as representing people as shapes without features. Minimalist fashion also exists, which is just muted colors on a simple top and bottom. There's really nothing more to describe it as since it's, well, minimalism. The Halloween aesthetic is basically the feeling in the air when Halloween rolls around every year. While similar to horror, Halloween aesthetic is a lot more lighter in tone and sillier. It's not intended to evoke fear, but rather the joy of the holiday. The aesthetic includes the imagery we usually associate with Halloween, such as full moons, pumpkins, different types of monsters, candy, and the decorations people put up on their homes. In terms of fashion, it's either the costumes people wear on the holiday, or the clothes people wear in fall, such as light jackets and flannel. Overall, lots of orange and black, as well as some green, purple, and muted autumn colors. Moving on to another holiday aesthetic, the Christmas aesthetic is the feeling you get when Christmas rolls around, which in my experience is a lot stronger than the Halloween feeling. Despite Christmas being in a cold time of year, the aesthetic evokes a feeling of warmth and coziness. Imagery associated with Christmas include fireplaces, stockings, mistletoe, holly, wrapped presents, sweaters, pajamas, vintage toys, snow, and of course, decorated Christmas trees. Lots of white, gold, red, and green. Overall, the Christmas aesthetic is one that brings joy to many people. These are aesthetics revolving around the different seasons. Since this is basically a foreign one, I'll keep the descriptions of each season brief. Spring is a season revolving around life and rebirth. As such, the aesthetic is optimistic and colorful with an abundance of patterns, especially floral patterns and animals. Summer is a season that is associated with joy and freedom, as it is the season most people are off for vacation, as well as being a hot season, meaning most people are outside. It is often associated with beaches and poles, since these are popular destinations for people to cool off during the summer. There is also emphasis on food, such as barbecue, ice cream, and tropical drinks. The clothes associated with summer show more skin, such as tropical beach shirts, shorts, sundresses, and swimwear. The clothes will often feature light or bright colors, as well as bold patterns. Autumn is the harvest season, and this has majorly influenced its aesthetic even in the modern day. It's also the season where the leaves on trees change color and fall off, which is possibly the most iconic imagery when it comes to the season. Other imagery includes warm, natural lighting like candles, fruits and vegetables like apples, gourds, and berries, as well as sluggish, colder weather. This season also has a more academic vibe, as it's the season when many people return to school or university. As such, the fall aesthetic has an academic sub-theme, like reading literature or wearing formal clothes like sweaters and khakis. Other aspects of autumn fashion include muted red, yellow, brown, and beige colors on heavier, sometimes layered clothes like turtlenecks and cardigans. Winter is the coldest season of the year, which influences its vibes and fashion heavily. Since most people are indoors, winter aesthetic often revolves around cozy indoor activities. This includes reading by the fire, baking, and drinking hot cocoa. However, there is also an outdoor aspect to the activities and especially the fashion. Outdoor activities like sledding and playing in the snow are part of the winter aesthetic. The fashion includes heavy clothing which keeps you warm, such as gloves, long coats, boots, scarves, and wool hats. Indie is short for independence, which is why the aesthetic revolves around individuality. It was a 2000s trend, but it came back in 2019 thanks to our old friend TikTok. I'm gonna be honest, this aesthetic is so broad and popular that I don't even know where to begin to describe it. It's ironic that indie, despite meaning niche and independent, is one of the most popular aesthetics. It's fitting because nowadays, the most popular films, games, and music technically fall under the indie category. If I had to describe it briefly, it would be like grunge, edgy pastel. Overall, I have no problem with indie style, as it's good looking and easy for teens to pull off. Pretty self-explanatory, this aesthetic revolves around the old western United States. 
So basically lots of cowboys, horses, and deserts. A lot of the times, people into this aesthetic are into the idea of the lone hero, the guy who rolls into the town, saves the day, and leaves like he was never there. The fashion is basically dressing up like a cowboy, with vests, button-down shirts, boots with spurs, and of course, the iconic cowboy hat. There's also iconic western sounds, including music with guitar and flutes, as well as that southern drawl. Overall, this aesthetic is really popular due to the extreme abundance of American cowboy movies in the 20th century, and the influences even reach into media of other genres like Cowboy Bebop and The Mandalorian. Country is similar to Western, except for the fact that country is really based on the modern lives of American farmers and ranchers instead of the lives of cowboys in the 19th century and as such takes out any feel of lawlessness and adventure. In fact, you can say that the very opposite is true. Country is a very homely aesthetic, placing emphasis on tradition, family, Christianity, and hard work. A lot of this is perpetuated through the genre of country music, which is the most popular medium this aesthetic is spread through. In terms of visual, the country aesthetic features cornfields, farm animals and equipment, pickup trucks, acoustic guitars, and wooden home decor often featuring messages about family, God, or America, as well as barns and countryside homes. In terms of fashion, country fashion romanticizes and emulates the wear of modern-day ranchers and farmers. This includes flannel shirts, denim jeans, cowboy hats, and work boots. Jock is an American aesthetic that seems to have been prevalent in the 50s to 80s, but I doubt the aesthetic as presented even exists anymore because I've only ever seen it in movies. The jock refers to a teenage boy in high school who is known for playing sports, typically football. They are depicted as the top of the social hierarchy and are also stereotypically bullies. In terms of visuals, the jock aesthetic places emphasis on a romanticized view of high school, especially in its social and aesthetic aspects. Fashion-wise, the only thing that stands out to me is a school varsity jacket. Like I said before, it seems like this aesthetic, at least the most stereotypical version of it, just seems like a product of movies about high school, because in my time during high school, it never seemed to be as separated and hostile as the movies depict. There's a joke that writers of 80s and 90s high school movies always depict the jocks as bullies, because back when those writers were in high school themselves, they were social outcasts and resented the popular athletic kids, so when they grew up they would just write about them in a negative light. Of course, this is all just speculation. The nerd aesthetic, just like the jock one, is another over-the-top look given to a group of high school kids. Nerds are considered as students who are invested in book smart culture, that is, someone who is knowledgeable in school subjects, specifically STEM subjects like math and science. Nerds are stereotypically socially awkward, often being bullied and only befriending other nerds, if they even have friends. The stereotypical nerd clothes are long sleeve button down shirts, oversized glasses, khakis, dress shoes, and sometimes even suspenders. Once again, this is just the over the top nerd aesthetic, which is not representative of real life. Geeks are often confused with nerds, but there are differences between the two groups. Geeks, rather than being a group of people who are ultra committed to academics, are instead obsessed with a hobby of theirs typically something non-physical like video games or comic books. While being smart is not necessarily inherent to being a geek, it has become associated with them because their hobbies included tech like computers or video game consoles, which were considered high-tech stuff only smart people could handle back then. Geeks were also more social and had more friends than nerds, since they would often seek out a group of people who shared the same interests. In terms of visuals, there isn't really a fashion associated with geeks, but a lot of brands and franchises like Star Wars, various superheroes, and video games are geek icons. Once again, I'd say that this is just a relic of the 80s and 90s, because now all the staples that made geeks geeks are mainstream. Stuff like computers, superheroes, and video games are all basically mainstream now, so there's really nothing distinguishing geeks except for those who are seriously obsessed with their interests. Greaser was an aesthetic prominent in American teen boys during the 50s. The name is derived from their greased up hair, often styled in exaggerated fashion. The greaser's look is a very iconic one, consisting of tight t-shirts, leather jackets, jeans, and boots, alongside the iconic hair I mentioned earlier. 
Greasers were your stereotypical bad boys. They drove motorcycles and convertibles, smoked, and most would be members of street gangs and participated in fights against other gangs, carrying switchblades around for this exact purpose. Despite being violent, greasers are now romanticized in films and medias revolving around that era, which is a trend that doesn't just stop with its aesthetic. Prep is a term used to refer to teenagers who are a part of the pipeline to a prestigious, typically Ivy League college. They usually come from wealthy, upper-class families, and their parents probably went to the same expensive college that they will go to in the future. For prep kids, college is less of a place to get an education and a degree, and more of a way for them to make connections within their social circles so that when they eventually go on to get a high-ranking job straight out of college, they have a bunch of friends in other high positions throughout society. Prep has a very distinct visual style, with pastel polos and khakis, as well as knee-length skirts for girls. Cardigans, sweaters, and loafers are also common clothing choices, and usually when it is warm outside, preps will tie their sweaters around their neck, which is an iconic look for this aesthetic. There's also a nautical theme within this aesthetic. The reason why is because prep is associated with the northeast coast, where many of the wealthy live in very close proximity to the shore. Common activities for prep kids include going out in yachts, and rowing also tends to be a favorite sport of the Ivy League institutions. Speaking of sports, certain sports are associated with prep because these are preferred activities of the Northeast elite, and the sports tend to be ones with high costs of entry, blocking outsiders from entering. Some of these sports include lacrosse, polo, and of course, rowing like I said before. This is on the iceberg, but the aesthetic is very similar to High School Dream, which is way further down. So I won't be going into tons of detail on this one, because I really don't want to repeat myself. But this aesthetic is basically just the way a high school cheerleader dresses and the social lives they lead. Theater is yet another academic aesthetic revolving around the study of theatrical plays and dramas. Visuals of this aesthetic include ornate stages, backstage, theater props and costumes, as well as an older, fancy institution. Colors associated with theaters are typical natural colors, browns, beiges, and some grays, but red and gold are also prominent since those tend to be the colors of stage drapes, an iconic visual of theater. People who are into this aesthetic are obviously those involved in theater, and their hobbies, which are part of this aesthetic, include reading plays, rehearsing, and doing backstage work like costume and prop design. Fashion of the theater aesthetic includes turtleneck sweaters, blazers, dresses, khakis, and berets. Neko is an aesthetic originating in Japan which revolves around cats and cat-like features. The aesthetic is very childlike and feminine, emphasizing innocent behavior, soft textures and colors, as well as general cuteness. In terms of fashion, some clothes include cat ears, chokers with bells, maid outfits, oversized hoodies, often with cat ears on the hood, as well as mittens resembling paws. I know where this childlike cuteness is coming from, since house cats are definitely very cute, but I still find a bit of irony in this because cats are also cold-blooded killers, which is the opposite of innocence. The fairy tale aesthetic is similar to the fantasy aesthetic, but fairy tales tend to be way less gritty and lighter in scope and stakes. Basically, it's the difference between classic Disney movies and Lord of the Rings. The fairy tale aesthetic has heavy emphasis on magic, talking animals, and fictional creatures like fairies, gnomes, and mermaids. The visual side of the aesthetic places heavy emphasis on nature, especially the beauty of it. Images of mushrooms, peaceful animals, forests, rivers, quaint paths, and picturesque villages, and scenic castles dominate fairy tales. Other visuals include old books, ornate mirrors, crowns, extravagant dresses, and cloaks. Basically, like I said, pick out a Disney movie featuring a princess in a European setting and you'll see some perfect examples of fairy tale aesthetic. Pirate is an aesthetic that romanticizes the pirates of the golden age of piracy in between 1650 and 1720. However, the aesthetic does not seek to glorify the horrible atrocities these pirates committed but rather places emphasis on the air of freedom, exploration, and camaraderie associated with pirates. Popular visuals of the pirate aesthetic include the Jolly Roger, other imagery of bones, chests and treasure, deserted islands and coves, vintage maps, compasses, keys, and of course, the high seas. 
while you probably won't find someone straight up dressed like a pirate, you can probably pull off some aspect of pirate fashion, especially if you're visiting a coastal tropical area. This includes neutral colors like red, white, and brown, combined with oversized button-down blouses, oversized blazers, square belts, and heeled boots. Being an aesthetic revolving all around the water, it's a fitting one to end the first layer of this iceberg, because so far we were just in the sky, and now we're starting to hit the water, and it's only going to get harder to navigate from here. Scene is an aesthetic that started in the 1990s and grew extremely popular in the late 2000s among the youth. They were often confused with the emo community of the late 2000s, and I'm going to be honest, before I did my research with this video, I thought they were the same thing too. They are similar, with a major difference being that Scene is a lot more colorful and vibrant. The fashion included bright patterns, fishnets, long sideswept hair, eyeliner, and graphic tees with bands or depictions of popular cartoons of the time. Scene was popularized among teenagers at the time as a way to blur the lines between how men and women look, and to appear as androgynous as possible. While this aesthetic died out in the early to mid 2010s, you'll still find people in their late 20s posting pictures of themselves of when they were teenagers dressing up in scene and fashion. Like I said about emo, this was basically what your stereotypical teen looked like in the MySpace era. Lolita is a very specific type of fashion aesthetic. It is a Japanese fashion trend which takes inspiration from Victorian era clothing. It involves a full skirt being worn over a petticoat, with the top part of the dress being worn over a blouse. The style came from young women in the 90s, wearing clothes in such a way to defy male expectations at the time of what girls should look like. Glitch is an artistic aesthetic based off of visual software glitches, usually styled in a 90s or early 2000s software interface. Something important to consider in order to fully understand the glitch aesthetic is the difference between a glitch and a bug. In coding, a bug is an error in the code that is usually the fault of a human writing it, which means that it can be easily fixed. However, the connotation of glitch is much more mysterious. It's an error that is unexplainable, almost supernatural. Obviously, there is no such thing as a supernatural computer error, but that's what the word glitch has come to mean especially when phrases like glitch in the matrix are used to describe unexplainable events. The glitch aesthetic includes bright colors, typically reds, blues, and greens. It is very sharp angled and staticky, often included with broken and erratic animation, as well as visuals evoking vintage computer technology. It is meant to show something that has malfunctioned. This aesthetic is often used alongside the vaporwave aesthetic. Grunge is an aesthetic which dominated the 1990s young adult scene. Basically, if you're an American teenager watching this video, your parents most likely dressed and acted like this when they were younger. Grunge is an aesthetic revolving around rebellion and anti-consumerism, which is especially ironic considering the teens participating in this grew up to be, well, our parents. The aesthetic was spearheaded by popular bands at the time, like Nirvana, Pearl Jam, and Alice in Chains. Grunge held a pessimistic ideology about the nature of society, and thus would reject the status quo and purposefully go the other way. As such, it is dominated by griminess and dirtiness. While there is a grunge look, the ideology of grunge is that there is no fashion associated with it, with the clothes worn as part of the aesthetic purposefully being the cheapest clothes at the thrift store, which falls in line with grunge's anti-consumerism philosophy. However, there isn't a lot of variety when you're talking about the cheapest clothes available at thrift stores, so a unified look did end up coming out of grunge, mainly including bland colored clothes. Your typical grunge teenager would spend their free time collecting vinyl music discs and smoking. This aesthetic died down when the bands I mentioned before died in popularity, and the young anti-consumerists were forced to take up adult responsibility in a capitalist society. However, you can probably mention grunge or those bands to your parents, and they'll probably still talk to you all day about the good old days. Dark Academia is an aesthetic which romanticizes the upper education of the 19th and early 20th century. Typically, European and American higher education in those time periods would be dominated by children from wealthy families who would study subjects like Latin, 
literature, and history. In the modern day, these subjects are not seen as practical ones to study for a living compared to something like STEM majors. Therefore, the association of dark academia with these humanities subjects further increases the romanticization of the aesthetic, since people who will continue to study these subjects are those who truly enjoy them and do it for their own self-fulfillment. However, the actual studying is not the focus of the aesthetic. It is rather the air of mystery and darkness surrounding the setting of the institution. Dark academia usually takes place in an older university with gothic architecture, such as prestigious English universities or the American Ivy Leagues. The school also usually features dormitory living and school uniforms, the western kind with sweaters and ties. The dark part of the academia comes from the idea of the aesthetic that such an institution will carry lots of dark secrets that students can uncover at their time there. This will typically lead to dark rituals, murder, and passion, which is amplified by the fact that they are in a strict institution and should not be doing this. If you couldn't figure it out by now, this aesthetic is basically people who love Hogwarts from Harry Potter. I mean, it checks off all the boxes of dark academia. No wonder people who wanted to experience those halls for themselves would romanticize a similar education with a more mature twist as they grew older. Here we have the flip side of dark academia, called light academia. Surprisingly, light academia was created after dark academia, when Tumblr users wondered why learning at a university had to be all doom and gloom. The aesthetic is very similar to dark academia, except that instead of backstabbing and murdering your friends on a gloomy weekend while you uncover the dark history of the school, you all instead enjoy a nice picnic on a sunny day. That's it, just have a good time while studying at a nice school. Synthwave is an aesthetic heavily rooted in 80s electronic style. While this is often confused with Vaporwave, Synthwave is actually an inspiration of Vaporwave. Synthwave only uses electronic tones on a beat to create music, while Vaporwave has influences from lo-fi, pop, and jazz. Synthwave visuals include lots of bold colors and grids, as well as visuals like retro graphics, sunsets, and 80s cars. The electronic feel of the aesthetic made it an internet favorite, and you can find examples of Synthwave everywhere in cyberspace. Art Moms, more commonly known as Art Hoes, is an aesthetic that revolves around loving art. Despite the oddly derogatory name, there is really nothing derogatory about this aesthetic. It's just people who enjoy art and nature, often painting or taking pictures of optimistic images. They typically dress in a vintage look, enjoying colorful striped shirts, wide bottom jeans, hair clips, and classic band shoes. They let their creativity shine, and some even customize their clothes by painting or drawing on them to add their own personal flair. Can't go into too much detail with this one, and I probably won't even show an example, but Baby Girl is an aesthetic where adult women will often dress in clothes and colors and act in such a way that involves a childlike and even infant-like persona. Obviously, the main color of this aesthetic is pastel pink. The reason why this aesthetic creeps me out is because it fetishizes childlike behavior and looks, which is honestly just a big yikes. Cottagecore is an aesthetic which romanticizes the old-fashioned, western, self-sufficient world living. A lot of people who are into cottagecore enjoy the idea of dropping modern life, responsibilities, and technology, running to the countryside with a loved one, and just living off the land. The aesthetic includes doing traditional hobbies, like sewing, knitting, baking, and gardening. However, one must question the authenticity of no technology being part of this aesthetic when playing Animal Crossing on your Nintendo Switch is considered one of the activities of the cottagecore aesthetic. Although, I guess it gets a pass because the activities you do in-game very much fit the aesthetic. This aesthetic can be described as natural. The clothes worn are muted earthen and pastel colors and usually will be something that they can make by themselves. A lot of the imagery includes cute animals, flowers, mushrooms, forests, and small gardens. However, there will always be some human structure in it, whether it be a quaint wooden fence or dock, or a small cozy cottage. The funny thing about cottage core is that the aesthetic has been picked up as a political symbol by the extremes on both sides of the spectrum. This is because both the far left and the far right have a distaste for modern society and want some aspects to go back although for different reasons. On one hand, people on the right appreciate cottagecore because it represents a time before, in their view, progressive values changed modern society for the worse. 
To them, cottagecore represents a period where traditional gender and social norms were still followed. On the other hand, people on the left appreciate cottagecore because it represents a time when our current capitalist society didn't have its hands around our throat, forcing us to wage slave away. To them, cottagecore represents a life where they don't have to spend their life working to enrich the pockets of some billionaires, but rather a life where their work actually is fulfilling and directly benefits themselves, so they can spend some more leisure time to just enjoy life. Just an interesting thought. Um, this is quite a strange aesthetic to include, but might as well just talk about it. This is about the pop culture representation of Vikings, the 8th to 11th century seafaring Nordic raiders. Popular visuals include axes, long boats with dragon heads, horned helmets, and runes. Unfortunately, the Viking aesthetic has been used and warped by certain white supremacist groups to support their agenda, which is probably one of the only prevalent places where the Viking aesthetic appears in the modern day. Steampunk is an aesthetic which is derived from the science fiction genre of the same name. What if we lived in an alternate reality where instead of inventing the combustion engine that was powered by gasoline and oil, and eventually created electronics, we instead continued developing technology powered by steam? Well, steampunk offers a look into that alternate history. In terms of how it looks, steampunk seems stuck in the Victorian era. Not only is all the technology made out of wood, brass, and gold instead of modern plastics, the clothes are also from that era, with long coats and top hats for the men as well as corsets and dresses for the women. There are a lot of gears, pistons, and pipes in steampunk. The technologies showcased are typically improved versions of Victorian era vehicles we later embedded in our time, such as airships and steam locomotives. However, completely imaginary technology like steam-powered mechs are also a part of steampunk art. For artistic motifs, gears and cogs are the de facto logo for the steampunk genre, Although depictions of sea creatures like squid and octopi are also associated with steampunk for some reason. Overall, steampunk is a very cool looking aesthetic, and it is well known for a good reason. Old Hollywood is an aesthetic revolving around upper class star life from the 1920s to the 1950s. This aesthetic romanticizes the day to day life of those old Hollywood stars, ignoring all the heinous stuff that was going on in the industry and in the world at the time. The fashion would be slicked hair, thin mustaches, and sharp suits for the men, as well as wavy hair, backless evening gowns, fur coats, and bold red lipstick for the women. The aesthetic is mostly followed by people who watch The Great Gatsby and want to live the upper class life of someone in the early 1900s. Surrealism is a well known artistic style that arose in the early 1900s. It rejected the then prominent notion that art should be a realistic depiction of still life and would rather paint settings that came forth from dreams and the unconscious mind. What resulted was a distortion of everyday objects in weird shapes in a dream-like landscape. One of the best-known artists of this style is Salvador Dali. Pastel refers to an aesthetic color scheme. Pastel colors are derived when the color white is mixed into a base color, giving it a softer and lighter look. Pastel is often used in dreamy and cute images, and is now associated with kids and girls. Although surprisingly, in the 80s, pastel colors were a trend in men's fashion, with shows like Miami Vice showing cool guys pulling off pastel colors. Rave is an aesthetic that grew in popularity in the 80s. It revolves around the high energy nightclub parties at the time, also known as raves. Raves were characterized by nightclubs playing loud and fast EDM, and the defining aspect of the rave aesthetic is neon. The clubs would be lit up by neon lights, the clothes and accessories you wore would be neon, everything is neon in rave. Lo-fi is a primarily music-based aesthetic that it aims to invoke a feeling of calm and nostalgia. The music achieves this vibe through low-intensity, muted electronic hip-hop that is slightly distorted to give it an aged feel. Of course, many people know of the lo-fi genre through the channel Lo-Fi Girl and their livestream Lo-Fi Hip Hop Radio, Beats to Study or Relax to. This livestream has been up and running for years, playing different lo-fi tracks such as the visual of the famous Lo-Fi Girl, who has been stuck in an endless loop of studying. This is one of the most popular livestreams on YouTube, with it always having tens of thousands of listeners 24-7. The visual side of lo-fi is a mix of different genres which all invoke nostalgia. 
mostly it is muted vaporwave colors with images of slice of life anime. Overall, it's really just a pleasant aesthetic that is perfect for relaxing or getting in a zone. Femboys are the opposite of tomboys. They are boys who like to present in a more feminine manner. Despite tomboys being relatively normalized since the 90s, femboys are still seen as somewhat abnormal. However, exposure and acceptance of this aesthetic has exploded over the past couple years through social media like TikTok and Twitch, as well as the popularization of anime. The anime art style typically gives everyone more feminine features, especially feminine faces, and femboys are not a new concept in Japan. Technically, they've been part of their society for over a hundred years, being known as Bokashu, and it was only interrupted during the imperial period of World War II. It makes sense that such a thing would bleed over into modern Japanese media. And as Japanese influence in Western and online culture continues to increase, concepts like these will eventually transfer over. Like I said before, femboys are basically the opposite of tomboys, which means that they typically dress and do activities stereotypically associated with women. This means stuff like skirts, thigh highs, and maid outfits. This aesthetic is very popular on platforms like Twitter, Twitch, and TikTok, with popular influencers like Fundy often dressing up in maid outfits for streams and receiving lots of positive feedback for it. Retrofuturism is a really cool aesthetic. It's basically what people in the past, specifically the early to mid-1900s, thought life and technology in the future would look like. Retrofuturism tends to be more optimistic than other genres predicting the future, like cyberpunk, since even though these decades were plagued with strife and suffering, there was still an anticipation for what the future would bring, especially during the space race of the 60s, and many middle class white Americans who were making these predictions believed that we would have solved all the world's issues by the 2000s, declaring that we were at the end of history and the beginning of an era of peace and prosperity. As such, the artwork of retrofuturism rarely included weapons of war. Instead, it would show off technology in a utopian society, often based off of how the technology of the time looked. They would feature novel public transportation, humanoid robots serving us around the household, and space travel. In terms of looks, the best way I can describe it is like this. If the aesthetic of steampunk is if society advanced while keeping the fashion and technological look of the Victorian era, the aesthetic of retrofuturism is if we kept the look of mid-1900s America going through the future. Plant moms is a term used for people who love gardening in nature, so much so that they take care of their plants like their own biological children. They often have an extensive collection of plants that they use a lot of their free time and energy to care for. In terms of looks, they are similar to the art mom aesthetic but with a lot more emphasis on the nature. The colors tend to be more muted and earthen, and they'll wear clothes that are hip but still comfortable for the more physical work involved in gardening, such as sweaters, jeans, and sneakers. Club is an aesthetic that revolves around nightlife such as nightclubs and bars that operate late into the night. It is very similar to the rave aesthetic we talked about earlier, sharing the same party vibe and bright colors, but club aesthetic and fashion tends to be more higher class than raves. Also, compared to the harsh neon of rave, club lighting tends to be more spread out and soft, creating a more intimate setting. Fashion is quite broad for this aesthetic. You want to wear something nice and more expensive, but you also want it to be light enough to be comfortable in the hot and packed club scenes. I'm going to be honest, vintage is really broad, perhaps the broadest aesthetic on this whole iceberg. It literally just refers to an aesthetic that evokes a time period from the past. Vintage could refer to a visual style from the 1920s, or an outfit meant to replicate 1990s fashion. Honestly, I probably already covered or will cover everything under the vintage umbrella, since there are so many aesthetics about past time periods elsewhere on the iceberg. Kawaii is a Japanese aesthetic that translates to cute or adorable. The aesthetic is used to refer to something that is very cute, so cute in fact that you almost pity it. It tries to invoke a young child vibe through using pastel colors as well as images from young children shows like Hello Kitty. In fact, Hello Kitty is literally just a whole kawaii aesthetic condensed into one thing, so there you go. City Pop is an old Japanese aesthetic from the 1970s and 1980s. In this time, Japan was going through an economic boom, so many Japanese citizens enjoyed an increased quality of life. 
The aesthetic is about the carefree, casual, and upbeat life many Japanese city youth lived in that time. This is reflected in its corresponding music genre. City pop mixes several genres like soft rock, R&B, and smooth jazz, combined with upbeat pop lyrics to give it a very casual feel, like the vibe of hanging out with friends on a summer afternoon. Popular songs from that era still have a following today, even outside Japan, such as Maria Takuchi's Plastic Love. In terms of fashion, city pop was a combination of preppy yet casual. Clothes included school uniforms, polo shirts, scarves, and pleated skirts. Another defining part of the fashion is the hair, which could be described with one word, volume. Girls would often let their hair grow long and slightly wavy, allowing bangs to hang over their foreheads. Guys would also allow their hair to grow long, and would part it in the middle. Some of them styled it like 50s American greasers, which honestly makes sense since this time period of Japan was similar to America's 50s. Overall, city pop is a very influential aesthetic, because it's basically the precursor to popular modern aesthetics like vaporwave and lo-fi, so this is one we should pay our respects to. Victorian is an aesthetic that refers to the fashion and culture of England in the 1830s to 1890s, specifically the upper class rural life. You know, those big ornate mansions in the countryside. Novels like Pride and Prejudice and Wuthering Heights are responsible for the popularity of the Victorian aesthetic today, especially among women. A lot of girls I know, including my own mother, absolutely adore the Victorian aesthetic due to these romance novels. I guess the idea of being a member of that society, dressing up in fancy gowns and dancing in balls, and then being swept off your feet by a handsome nobleman is appealing. Here's some dating advice, fellas. If you want to get a girl, first insult her by calling her lower class, and then apologize to her by meeting her in a field on a foggy morning and then ask her out. Guaranteed to work every time. Nuclear is an aesthetic revolving around nuclear power and radiation. It isn't just nuclear bombs, but stuff like nuclear plant control rooms, gas masks, hazard suits, and irradiated landscapes. The defining feel I get from the nuclear aesthetic is that eerie sense of using technology to try and control a power that we may not have the ability to fully understand, and when it goes wrong, it goes wrong badly. Basically, if you loved the HBO Chernobyl miniseries, you'll love this aesthetic. The post-apocalyptic aesthetic revolves around what life would look like after total societal collapse. Typically, the genre is a romanticized depiction of how such an event would go down, as it follows a small group of people who survive in the lawless wasteland. This aesthetic is often romanticized because a lot of people who are dissatisfied with their current role in society may wish that it should collapse so they don't have to fulfill their responsibilities anymore and then become a badass, rugged survivalist living off the land. Obviously, this is all best left in fantasy, since in an actual collapse of society, you'd probably be dead, a slave, or otherwise suffering. I'd rather have my biggest problem be an upcoming math test than a bunch of starving people trying to cannibalize me. Visuals of post-apocalypse always include human structures in ruin or decay. A common theme of post-apocalypse is that our modern society and technology has become a thing of legend, only existing in the past as a monument of what humanity once was. Nothing new is created on an industrial level. If possible, we just scavenged the technology that was already there. Depending on the type of apocalypse, nature could either be wiped out like us, or nature could be even more present, taking over what was once the human domain. Other visuals include weapons and utilitarian clothing, as well as old, repurposed technology. Mori K is an extremely niche Japanese aesthetic. It basically means women who live in the woods. The fashion includes loose and earthen, yet still feminine clothes. Usually, the clothes are embroidered with a pattern of some sort. Flowers are a huge part of the aesthetic, either present through embroidery or just straight up wearing them in your hair. Androgynous is a fashion aesthetic which rejects any clothing choice that can be associated with either the male or female gender. Instead, they opt for clothing choices that can blend the look between male and female. More formal androgynous aesthetic includes sweaters, collared shirts, and khakis, while more casual stuff includes stuff like hoodies, t-shirts, jeans, and shorts. To be honest, a lot of people dress androgynously for day-to-day -day life, but I'd say to fully pull off the look, stuff like how you present your hair and your face determines whether you have a true androgynous look. Um, so this used to be like a derogatory word when I was growing up, but apparently it has been taken back by some groups of women, so that's cool I guess. 
However, I'm still going to censor it just in case YouTube doesn't like it. The current movement was started by TikTok user Nat to Twitch a couple years ago, and the whole point of the aesthetic is for women to feel comfortable in their own bodies after having them being objectified by men for basically all of history. It's a progressive movement which has women taking back what should be theirs. I agree that no person should have to feel inherently dirty or invite attention just because of how their body naturally looks. It's an aesthetic that's really about helping women who have been dehumanized because of their body, and I'm here for it. Foodie is an aesthetic revolving around food, if that wasn't obvious. Basically, a foodie is someone who seeks out new and more refined food experiences constantly. They're always up to trying something new culinary-wise. They treat food as a hobby instead of something you just eat for sustenance. However, the aesthetic is definitely about the way the food is presented. The color and composition of the food, which shows that it's something more than just some typical meal one throws together to just eat, is what the foodie aesthetic is all about. New Age is an aesthetic that is designed to create inspiration, relaxation, and optimism. There's a lot to unpack here, but basically the best way to describe the aesthetic is that it's those people who are always talking about how to unblock your chakras and about astrology and yoga and all that. We all know who they are and what they wear and the artwork associated with them, so I can safely say that we can move on. Gyaru is another Japanese aesthetic that I'm kind of struggling to explain. It's a very voluptuous feminine aesthetic, defined by tanned skin, full hair, lots of makeup, as well as more rebellious outfits. Overall, it just looks like the Japanese version of women's fashion in the 80s, and it's probably only on this list because there's a specific name associated with it. Magical Girls is a genre of anime that revolves around young teenage girls who gain supernatural powers and then go on to save the world. While this is similar to other types of teenage superhero shows, what makes Magical Girls so popular is the fact that these young, strong girls keep their femininity. Back in the day when the Magical Girl genre was in its prime, most female superheroes had to look and act more masculine for the general public to accept them as a hero. The Magical Girl genre rejected this, instead having the characters keep their more feminine aesthetic as well as visuals like glitter, hearts, ribbons, and colors like pink, which are prominent. In terms of fashion style, the characters in the show would often wear stuff like schoolgirl uniforms featuring pleated skirts, as well as other stereotypically female clothing like bows. Overall, the aesthetic was prominently featured in anime like Sailor Moon, where the main characters would have to balance their life between their magical hero work and their life as a normal teenage girl, so I'd say the aesthetic fits the theme of these shows. Film noir is a genre which was popular since the 1950s. Common visuals of noir is a black and white color palette with stark lighting, big American cities, revolvers, rain, fog, and classic suits with fedoras. This genre romanticizes the lone detective who is working against a world of crime and corruption, and as such, the aesthetic tends to be quite depressing and melancholy, shown through the visuals and the slow, sensual jazz associated with it. Femme Fatale is an aesthetic that refers to women who are mysterious, intelligent, dangerous, and seductive. This is a character archetype that has been around in film since the 1940s, and has remained popular to this day, as modern action movies are basically guaranteed to have such a character as their female lead. In terms of fashion, Femme Fatale always have to look their best, often being seen in either evening gowns and makeup, or for when they need to engage in heavy combat, black leather suits are the go-to. Femme Fatales are always mysterious and typically lone wolves, who don't show much emotion and keep much of their personal life shrouded in mystery. Like I said, this aesthetic is prominent in women of a good majority of action movies nowadays, so you should probably be familiar with it. Not much this aesthetic, it's yet another female-oriented one. This time, it refers to people who dress up in over-the-top expensive clothes, makeup, and jewelry to let the world know that they are wealthy, or at least give the facade of wealth. Hot Topic is an aesthetic that shares a name with the clothing store found in malls all over the United States. It is known for catering to the counterculture fashion choices, and as such, went through different aesthetic phases as what was considered counterculture changed over time. The first phase started from the store's beginnings in 1996, 
This phase was referred to as New Metal. New Metal was inspired by punk and goth fashion, however you can say it was a bit more mainstream. Due to this, many diehard followers of the punk and goth aesthetics would look down on those who bought from Hot Topic, but for those who didn't have access to the quote unquote real counterculture fashion, Hot Topic allowed for a more accessible and affordable way for people interested in that aesthetic to pull off the look. One of the most iconic pieces of clothing from this time were the fat pants. However, as the new metal aesthetic died down, Hot Topic had a choice to make. Would they continue to sell the same type of clothes, or will they change with the times? Well, they chose the latter, and they moved on to the new popular counterculture aesthetic, into what is known as the MySpace era. During the MySpace era, the popular clothes changed to those found in the scene and emo aesthetics. Hair dye and piercings were also popular during this time. Finally, they eventually transitioned into the modern era. During this time, counterculture moved to more geeky interests like anime, video games, internet culture, and K-pop. Therefore, a lot of what they would sell now were graphic tees and such pertaining to these topics. Other popular visuals were visual callbacks to popular childhood brands like Nickelodeon and Cartoon Network shows. The modern era is the first time where music didn't dominate counterculture, so the sections of the store that used to be for music also had adopted to the modern age, instead now being filled with Funko Pops and other similar merchandising. Overall, the Hot Topic aesthetic has always been about catering to the counterculture and will adapt to what the Hot Topics are right now. Scrapbook is an artistic aesthetic that shares a name with the scrapbooking hobby. Scrapbooking is a hobby which revolves around preserving your personal history in the form of a notebook. This typically includes cutting out pictures of precious memories, either photographs or memorabilia, and pasting them all in a notebook, often doodling and annotating them to provide context. This is a really optimistic and colorful aesthetic, all about looking back on good times with your friends and loved ones. The Playboy aesthetic is basically the stereotypical teenage boy's fantasy. It's all about growing up to be a rich and powerful businessman, but still having enough free time to spend most of your day not doing work. Basically, the Playboy is a wealthy male adult who never really grew up from being an immature kid, and now instead has more expensive toys, or what he sees as toys to play with, hence the name Playboy. Playboys are known to dress up nicely, often wearing the most expensive suits, watches, and dress shoes. However, these are not worn to convey professionalism, but rather status. They still want to convey a casual and fun vibe. Therefore, they usually don't fully adhere to corporate dress code, not wearing ties and wearing their suits and parts of their shirts unbuttoned. They are the rogues of the ultra-wealthy, they don't adhere to social clothes and have questionable morals. Other Playboy visuals include the signs of someone wealthy flaunting their wealth, with items such as supercars, yachts, and mansions being staples of the Playboy lifestyle. And of course, we can't forget that Playboys are usually surrounded by hot women that, to be honest, they probably won't care about after a night spent together. Some popular examples of the Playboy aesthetic include James Bond, Bruce Wayne, and Tony Stark in the first Iron Man movie. Vampires are monsters originating from Eastern European mythology. They were typically depicted as old, immortal men who could turn into bats and sustain themselves by drinking blood. They were weak to sunlight and holy water. Of course, the most quintessential image of a vampire came from the novel which made the whole concept popular, Bram Stoker's Dracula. Because of this origin, the visuals of vampire aesthetics still include images like fangs, bats, capes, the moon, and abandoned castles or manors. However, thanks to a certain popular book turned movie franchise, vampires in the modern age now have a stereotype of being young, attractive people. While they still wear more fancy clothes and tend to be part of an upper class or secret underground society, the major difference here is that they tend to be less explicitly evil monsters and more tragic characters who are often the love interests of the main character. I have no idea why vampires suddenly became heartthrobs. Maybe the fact that the primary form of killing is sucking your blood after biting your neck gives them a more passionate aura? I don't know man, I'm just here to talk about aesthetics. Tiki is an aesthetic which is inspired by Southeast Asian and Polynesian culture. It became popular in the West after World War II, when a lot of soldiers returned from the Pacific Theater. This interest manifested in what would be known as tiki bars. The tiki aesthetic emulated traditional island Polynesian culture, with imagery associated with it being bamboo furniture, lots of torches, and fire, 
traditional tiki heads, floral patterns, and volcanoes. There is also a nautical aspect to the aesthetic due to its island nature, so visuals like netting and maps are also common. In terms of fashion, common outfits in this aesthetic include floral print shirts, shorts, and flip-flops. Basically, if you watch SpongeBob SquarePants, the tiki aesthetic permeates the art and setting of that show, so that should give you a good idea. Tropical aesthetic is similar to the tiki aesthetic, but it is not specifically trying to emulate Polynesian culture. Therefore, the visuals are a lot more general, consisting of tropical islands, beaches, shipwrecks, coconuts, and warm sunsets with a cool breeze. Tropical fashion tends to vary based on age. While younger men and women often go for surfer clothes or swimwear, the more stereotypical tropical fashion includes Hawaiian t-shirts and khaki shorts, alongside flip-flops and hats. Overall, this is a very laid-back aesthetic, placing emphasis on the natural beauty of tropical environments. MLG is an aesthetic that revolves around older internet memes and montage parodies. MLG stands for Major League Gaming, which is an actual esports league, but on the internet, MLG has come to have been associated with montage parodies. A montage parody is a style of video where a YouTuber would show the best or most humorous clips of their gameplay, but edit it so heavily with meme sound effects and visuals to where it basically becomes a comedy. This aesthetic was really popular in 2015 to 2016, with it utilizing many of the popular and even then older memes of the time. The visuals of MLG included bright rainbow colors, memes like Pepe, Dode, Shrek, Illuminati, the Quickscope Sniper and Reticle, as well as green screen explosions. Fedoras, Doritos, and Mountain Dew were also recurring visuals in MLG. Eventually, MLG became so popular that it transcended just gaming montages, and people would put MLG-style edits over all sorts of videos, some examples being Pyrocynical's famous MLG Teletubbies and MLG Shrek. MLG is an aesthetic that I was surprised to see mentioned here, and I'm glad such an iconic time period of internet culture is being recognized. And that is it for part 1 of the iceberg. Even for the top couple layers, there's a lot of interesting stuff on here, and I learned a lot of things researching this video. However, I've taken a look at the deeper levels of the iceberg, and we're about to get to some really cool stuff in part 2. So stay tuned for that, and if you're watching this after I uploaded part 2, I'll definitely have it linked at the end of the video. Thank you for watching, and I hope to see you in part 2 of the Aesthetics Iceberg.